uh, Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877. So this period of Reconstruction lasts 12 years, and you'll see that the election of 1876 is what puts an end to it, okay? Uh, but let's get back to uh, these freed people, okay? Uh, what what did freedom mean? You know, what 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 did it what did it do for these people? One like I mentioned before, one day you're picking cotton and you're you're being uh, abused, and you have this psychological warfare life. You're trying you're trying to stay you know um, safe and healthy uh, against these people that want to hurt you. These plantation owners whip you, beat you, sell you away. So one day you're you're doing that. The next day they say, okay, you're free. See ya. What do you do? What what would be the first thing you would do if you were a freed slave? <clears throat> the truth is, most of them uh, went in search of family members. Remember, many were sold away. Uh, children, spouses, parents, cousins, whoever, to 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 reunite the family. Okay, but they also wanted voting rights. Without those, you have no power. You you can't rise in power and create a political or economic base. You can't vote. Right. They also want to build communities, you know, start their lives. Um, it, slaves didn't even have last names. So they, they you, you go out in the world with just, just your one name. You know, how do you integrate into a white society like that? So many of them use their former master's last name. And uh, you, you, a lot of them you chose Jefferson and Washington and Johnson and Lincoln because they, they wanted to honor these people, okay, that, that freed them, all right? Um Okay, I mentioned earlier about a, a celebrity from San Diego that's kind of is interestingly part of this story. So who is this person right here? Anybody know? This is Ladanian Tomlinson, also called LT, okay? Who's he? This is a very famous NFL football player, played for the San Diego Chargers when they were still still in San Diego. Uh, so Ladanian Tomlinson uh, is a very famous and very wealthy football player. He's retired now, okay? Now, Ladanian grew up in East Texas, very poor, okay? Uh, his his uh, family were sharecroppers. That's what they did. They, they worked rented land, okay? But very poor, impoverished, and LT grew up that way. Uh, but had athletic skill pretty clearly young, in a young age, and... Um, Pretty, pretty obviously a great athlete, and he becomes a football player uh, and gets a, a scholarship to Texas Christian University. So he goes to college on, on a football scholarship and then is a first-round draft pick in the NFL for the San Diego Chargers. So he's drafted, starts to starts his career, becomes one of the all-time greats, becomes a multi-millionaire, very, very wealthy man. Uh, but he thinks back to his roots, East Texas, and he grew up in a place called Tomlinson Hill, same name, right? And he always heard from his mother that it was called Tomlinson Hill in honor of his grandfather who helped to start the community and kind of was integral in, in getting that, that community off the ground, okay? So he lives in a place that's named after him or his grandfather anyway, so that was kind of cool, Okay. But during his career as an NFL player, of course, he comes back to East Texas on occasion to visit. <clears throat> he heard from, from a man named Chris Tomlinson, same last name. Chris Tomlinson contacts him and says, LT, would, you, would it be possible to meet you next time you're in Texas? I want to talk to you about a book I'm writing, okay? And, uh, of course, LaDainy is a little suspicious, and I think that anybody of color – it's just kind of ingrained in them, and another indication of a, you know, a racism that still persists in today's society. It's ingrained in people of color to be a little suspicious of white people and not trust them because they, they've broken promises so many times. Like, you know, what's this man want for me? What does this white man want for me? Right. So, uh, but LT agrees to come, and when he comes to Texas, he meets Chris, same last name. And Chris tells him about a book he's writing called Tomlinson Hill, the same name that on the sign when he was young, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so Tomlinson Hill, this is this book he's writing. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, gosh, I can't keep my throat together here. Sorry. Uh, what is this book about? The remarkable story of two families who share the Tomlinson name, one white, one black. 
Okay, so you got you got Chris Tomlinson's white, Ladanian Tomlinson's black. Is that who he's talking about here? Well, in fact, it is. So what what is this book about? Well, Tomlinson Hill, Ladanian learns from Chris. It was not not named after his grandfather at all. It was the name of a plantation that existed there for hundreds of years before the Civil War, and it was owned by uh, by ancestors of. Chris Tomlinson. So, so Chris Tomlinson was the descendant of slave owners that owned Tomlinson Hill. Okay, Ladanian is the ancestor of the slaves that worked the plantation. So, Chris Tomlinson, descendant of plantation owners, slave owners. Ladanian Tomlinson, descendant of the slaves who worked the Tomlinson land. Okay, that's why it's called Tomlinson. And L Ladanian realized right there. Well, wait a minute. Then I took my family took the slave named Tomlinson, the slave owner named Tomlinson. So this didn't sit well with him in the beginning. He was he was very uh, emotional and broken up about this. Like I I had no idea my 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 name <clears throat> was the last name of a, <clears throat> of a of a of a person who owned my family. So he wasn't too thrilled about that. But as it as time went on, he got used to it and kind of accepted it. And now he kind of wears it as a badge of honor. This is my slave name, and I'm proud to say that that's where I came from. And for those of you that are fans of him, if you saw his Hall of Fame speech, he was inducted into the National Football League Hall of Fame last summer. Uh, he gave a speech, <coughs> a very <coughs> rousing speech about <coughs> about this, um, and talks about you know, having this slave last name. So it's so a very very emotional. Okay, so so what's just an example of why, why am I showing you Ladanian Tomlinson's family? Well, he's an example of two things. One, he's taken the, the name of a slave owner, but two, his family is still on the same land that they were freed from, you know, almost 200 years ago. Okay, uh, so that's an indication. This happens a lot. Why can't they leave? Why are they still there? Why 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 would they still be on the same plantation land that they were freed from, you know, many many uh, decades ago? Uh, so this is where we come up to this idea of sharecropping. Okay, I'm going to do a supplemental lecture here in a minute, so I'm just preparing you for that. I'll go into detail about that in a minute. Okay, so so what's the problem? The problem is slaves are free, but they have no economic opportunities. They have no skills. They can't just go out and get a job. All they know how to do is pick cotton. Uh, a, a very small uh, uh, percentage of them had skills, blacksmith driver, you know, carpenter, whatever it might be, but the, but the vast majority were very unskilled. They picked cotton or some sort of crop for a living, okay? So how do, how do they now move forward and, and support themselves? And the other side of it was the plantation owners <clears throat> that used to have these large, uh, you know, uh, areas of land uh, being, being uh, you know, harvested for crops, now they have a ravaged uh, uh, land, maybe maybe ripped up by the war. Maybe their maybe their home was burnt down. Uh, you know the the Union forces came through, destroyed everything. So they need people to help them get it back into shape. Okay, so in a unique form, this is how these two people, these former adversaries, slave owner slave, come back together because they need each other. Okay, interesting turn of events to say the least. Uh, okay, so this is where, uh, okay, so that's Ladanian and Chris, sorry, I missed that last photo. So, so two men, same last name, not related, but connected in a unique way. Okay, this is supplemental lecture number one, and this is called sharecropping. So again, what, you should, what I would suggest you do on these supplemental lectures is, is take separate notes. Don't, don't, don't keep these in the middle of your regular notes. Keep these separate because you'll want to refer to them when the time comes, the midterm and final. I'm going to give you eight of these before the midterm. And then on the midterm uh, study guide, you'll study all eight on the, on the midterm itself. I'll take two away. I'm not going to tell you which ones. There'll be six remaining. You choose three to write about, okay? Same thing with the final. I'll, the, the, there'll be eight between the midterm and final. Same thing. Reduced to six, you choose three, okay? So what do I want you to know? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you a story here about you know something that has to do with our our subject in this case sharecropping, but it's outside of the book. Okay, not not that 
not that my lecture, my, my regular lectures verbatim by the book, it's not, but I do try to follow it. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking about things that you're reading about. Okay. <clears throat> but supplemental lectures are, are, are from me specifically. Okay. And they, you know, it, it's just a, a different slant or a different story that maybe you haven't heard before. Um, and what I want you to do is there's a, it, these are typically, you know, 10 to 15 minutes long. So I'm going to give you a lot of information. I don't expect you to remember everything, but they're, they're pretty obviously main points. I want you to recall the main points to me. What was this lecture about? Well, it was about this. Sharecropping is this, 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 and this. But mo most importantly, at, before you finish writing your essay, I want you to tell me what the relevance of the, of the lecture was. What, what relevance does sharecropping have to Chapter 15, Reconstruction? You know, why would I choose that for a lecture? You know, what, what purpose do you think I had in, in bringing this up? Okay, so that's kind of how a supplemental lecture works, okay? Uh, if you have further questions about that, uh, you can discussion board it, post it, and I will respond or email me. Again, I prefer that you ha ask me general questions on the discussion board so I don't have, you know, 30 people asking me the same question. Um, it just makes it easier for both of us, okay? <clears throat> so let's let's start our first supplemental lecture, okay? So using word association, when you see this picture, what is the first word that comes to your mind? Uh, what do you think? I mean, it looks like a slave, right? You got a young black man, boy, uh, it, you know, in rags on a, you know, plantation, working real hard. He's got a plow, a horse is pulling the plow. That's hard work, right? That looks like a slave to me, right? But you know what? He's not a slave. He's a freed man. He's a sharecropper. So what, so what is this sharecropping? And like I said, the, the, these two former adversaries kind of come together to help each other out. Each one needs the other in a, you know, unique way. Um, the black man can't find work. He's hungry. The white man can't find labor to repair his plantation, put it back, to, back into use. Okay. So they come back together. So on, you know, honestly, at the start of it, it, it kind of made sense. And it looked like maybe it was a possible solution to the problem. You're not enslaved anymore, but you're going to work here. Okay. Maybe it wouldn't make you happy, but what other choice did they have? They didn't have any other opportunities. Okay. So, so it creates work for former slaves uh, and and also for former slave owners. But as we'll see, based on again the 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 kind of uh, situation that we always go back to, greed and selfishness, and and abusive you know people take advantage of it, and and you know they what it ends up happening for the slave is it created a system of endless indebtedness. Okay, you stay in debt. You get you get caught in this cycle of debt. Okay, so let's let's go over this uh, uh, one by one here. Okay, so th th this is this slide is called the sharecropper cycle of poverty. Okay, so starting at the very top, number one, you've got the sharecropper, the former slave. You've got the plantation owner. Okay, uh, each one needs the other. So the sharecropper is provided land and seed by the plantation owner. Uh, and on that land would typically be a house, not a probably nice house, but maybe a little bit, you know, step up from a slave shack. Maybe not, maybe still a shack. But the point I'm trying to make is you have your own house with your own family, okay? The sharecroppers provide land and seed. In exchange, he promises the landowner half the crop that he harvests, okay? That's the rent. So for, for me to give you a place to live and a house, and opportunity, you get you you grow, you harvest, you give me half half the value of your crop. Doesn't sound so bad, okay? The, the, the slave, of course, is happy to be on his own, but but the slave says, well, but wait, I don't sharecropper. Sorry, says, but wait, I don't have any food or clothing or you know uh, knives and forks, plates, you know things that you need, right? Supplies that a family needs. I don't have those. I don't have any money. So the, so the landowner says, okay, you can buy food and clothing and supplies from me on credit. Okay. You can pay me back when you're, when the crop comes in. Okay, great. So we go to number three here. So the sharecropper takes the seeds, plants, the plants, uh, the typically cotton grows and the sharecropper harvests the crop, right? 
and and you know like like the deal said uh, the, the sharecropper gives the landowner the crop to sell uh, because the truth is a black man would not be accepted in the cotton market as coming to, to sell cotton they wouldn't they wouldn't let the, let him in so so he's got to give it to the white man okay but the sharecropper knows I'll get half the earnings minus the cost of his purchases for the year. So let's just make up some figures here. Um, let's just say for fun, uh, these are, these figures are just made up, just just for easy math. Okay, let's say that the crop that the share that the the uh, crop that the sharecropper uh, came up with was worth a thousand dollars. So that means he's going to get five hundred, right? Because the slip because the plantation owner is going to get five hundred for him. They split it. Okay. But the sharecropper has to pay the landowner back the the, uh, the uh, items he bought on credit. So the, the sharecropper says, well, that was $200 we spent. So he's going to give me $300. And he's going to take his $200 back and give me three. That's, that's not a bad deal. We're profitable the first year. Next year, we won't need as many supplies. Next year, we, the clothes we have, the, the clothing we have now will still be good. And we'll, we'll um, you know, we will be frugal and and we'll make more money and we'll get ahead okay but then you go to you go to point number five here when settling up the landowner says the sharecropper owes him more than he's earned well how is that possible well going back to number two you buy it on credit what happens when you buy things on credit from people they charge you interests okay the sharecropper had no idea what that even meant this is a this is an uneducated man. He, he doesn't know math. He probably doesn't know basic math. He, he, he may know how to, you know, add slightly, but anything, anything past that he wouldn't know. So, so of course, interest, compounded interest, he's got no idea what that means. What, what are you talking about? Well, it turns out the slave owner, I'm sorry, the plantation owner charged him an exorbitant amount of interest, okay? So the $200 that he, that he, um, that he borrowed, Ended up having, you know, three hundred dollars in um, in let, let's say four hundred dollars in uh, interest. Okay, so instead of instead of owing him three, the the slave owes him what would that be a hundred dollars? I think I did that right, but you get the idea. Um, his his three hundred dollar profit is eaten up by the three hundred dollar interest, which means now. You didn't make any money, and on top of that, you owe the, the plantation owner $100. You've worked the whole season, and you go in debt. You know, Oh, my gosh, this is awful. So to pay the debt, number six up here, to pay the debt, the sharecropper must promise the landowner a greater share of next year's crop. This starts an endless cycle. Every year, you go further and further into debt. You keep on giving up more and more of your crop, and, and you never – you never get ahead. So this is this is how how the this system that really could have worked out for everybody uh, was taken by the plantation owners and you know um, misused and um, you know manipulated and like they've been doing for years. They didn't know any better. They've been doing it for years, and they on some level re-enslave their own slaves back on their own property. Okay. By the time sharecroppers had shared their crops and paid their debts, they rarely had any money left. Often they were uneducated. Not not often, pretty much always. If you were a slave, you were you were <clears throat> for the most part uneducated. There was a one or two that might have been taught how to read or write, but very few. Okay, it was it was illegal to teach a slave how to read or write. <clears throat> So <clears throat> they were uneducated, and they could not argue with the landowners or merchants who cheated them. They, they didn't know anything about interest, and they, they, <clears throat> they didn't really know how to even approach an argument. So sharecropper frequently became tied to one plantation, having no choice but to work until his debts were paid. <clears throat> so again, this is what happened to Ladanian Tomlinson's family. They're still there because they got caught in this cycle of poverty that you can't get out of. So th this is, the, this is the, the ugly side of sharecropping. Again, a, a system that, that, that could have worked for everybody, but, but the plantation owners with their greed had to, you know, had to manipulate it, okay? Okay, so what are some advantages of sharecropping? Well, it gave slaves access to land. They had an economic opportunity. They could live as a family. They didn't have to worry about being sold away, <clears throat> okay? They still had to worry about violence, and as you'll see in your first film reflection, You'll see that, okay? 
for the owner, uh, the cost of managing the slaves was not, not your responsibility anymore. So slaves took care of their own food, water, shelter, clothing. Okay. And the plantation owners also had access to crops that they didn't have to manage. The slave did it all from, from start to finish. Okay. What were some disadvantages? Well, the, the, for the slave, it's a return to slavery and drudgery, or at least it, it felt like slavery again. And you're in constant debt. But, but a big one is lack of community. Now, what do I mean by that? If you if you took 109, you, you learn that slaves on plantations, especially like large plantations that had hundreds of slaves, they would develop their own very tight-knit community. But what, what, was their, what were their lives like? They spent all day working hard under the lash, constantly being, you know, worried about, you know, bodily uh, harm to them, psychological warfare all day long, trying to stay ahead of the owners and the overseers and not get in trouble. You had to pick, you know, your quota every day, you'd be whipped. Pretty, pretty tough way to live every day. Every day of your life, you're under this constant fear, okay? But at night, <clears throat> when the sun went down, <clears throat> The white people would go to the big house, the, the plantation home, and do their thing, have dinner, go to bed. The slaves were left by themselves, and this is when they started a community. At, at night, they'd all mingle, and they were free. You know, they were free every night to be who they wanted to be. So you, you start relationships, friendships, you know, you, you, you intermingle with each other. You get to know each other. You become very close-knit. People, people that go through... You know, a heroin experience together typically become connected for life. You 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 become close, okay? Uh, so this is this is one of the one of the uh, disadvantages of 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 the sharecropping is that now these people that were formerly um, you know always together at night now you're separated you know far apart in all these different different uh, lands. So so you lose community, okay? Okay, so by 1890, three out of four former slaves were sharecroppers, 75%. So 25 years after the Civil War, that's a long time, that's a generation, 25 years after the Civil War, uh, three out of four, 75% of former slaves were sharecroppers, which was kind of like being, being a slave again, right? There's, there's our slave again, working like slaves, uh, 25 years of time, nobody figured out any kind of economic opportunity for them except for this. Uh, and this is a quote from your book. Sharecropping was an efficient method to raise cotton and for former plantation owners to exploit the freed slaves because the lash of indebtedness was always on their back. So I mentioned that, that they would get whipped the la by a lash, right? When you're a slave, you, you feared the lash. You're going to get that lash on your back. But now you're a sharecropper. You may not be getting the lash on your back, but it feels like it because you're in debt, the lash of indebtedness, okay? So 25 years after the war, this is this is the state of the union. This is This is what North and South are like. It's very similar to the same thing. So can you begin to understand why we still have racism and discrimination in this country today? Because this this problem did not get alleviated until 1965. So it's only been 53 years that black people in America have had have had rights to the individual freedoms that was afforded to them by the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. <clears throat> okay. So at this point in, in American history, talking about the 19th century, we're, we're almost 300 years into it, and we're still dealing with this issue. Uh, so again, like I said in the beginning, race is the common thread through all of American history, even today. Okay. Okay, that is the end of that supplemental lecture. So again, keep those notes separate, and we'll and these will these will come pretty quick because we've only got eight weeks. So uh, eight weeks, sixteen lectures is two two a week. So be prepared for these to keep coming. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So what so what happened to Reconstruction? Why 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 did it fail? How did it fail? <clears throat> and what were the consequences? I mean, it, initially there was a period right after the war during the early Reconstruction era when blacks could vote. And black officials were elected for the first time. And here you see uh, this is an image of the first colored. We, we don't say that anymore. That's another subservient word to describe somebody. Uh, but in those days, they did the first colored senator and representatives. Okay, so you actually had 
you know, a black man become a senator. Okay, that's that's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, black communities were built around a central church. They created schools, newspapers. They, they tried to integrate themselves into a productive community, always separate from white communities, though, as we'll see. But slowly at first, <clears throat> the ex-Confederates regained control. You know, how, how'd they do that? You know, they, they didn't like the, these black people being called equal or free. They didn't like that at all. So they were exploited through sharecropping and legally segregated to keep them separate, keep them apart from white society. These ex-Confederates did not accept Republican governments. Now, remember, the military districts, you know, uh, had a – it was a Republican government in the South. They didn't like that. They, they want to reestablish a society like they had before the war, okay? Uh <clears throat> So I talked about the radical Republicans. Uh, they, they pushed for a civil rights bill. And this was passed in 1875. <clears throat> what did this do? Guaranteed African Americans equal treatment in public accommodations, public transportation. It prohibited it, it excluding them from jury service, and it offered them transportation in public accommodations to come to jury service. So that sounds pretty good. Of course, I think we all know about separate restaurants, separate drinking fountains, separate everything that comes into the 20th century. So if that's if that's if that happens in the 20th century, what what good was this act right here? Well, it, it didn't do anything. It, it, what's significant about this act? Nothing, because it wasn't in force. The South found ways to circumvent it, and they continued to oppress and discriminate, torture, and murder black people for nearly a hundred more years. Okay. So, um, so this era is pretty ugly. This era disintegrates quickly. Um, can you can you pinpoint it to to the, when Lincoln was killed? Some some say yes. It's it's one of those what ifs we'll never know. <clears throat> but I guarantee it would have been a lot different if he had lived. Okay. So so what what brought Reconstruction down? What what was its what was the end reason for its failure? <clears throat> It starts with a, with a, an economic depression, and we have these, you know, throughout American history. This is the Panic of 1873. Uh, this is a worldwide economic depression. Uh, this, of course, what's that mean? It means that money kind of dries up, right? And this this severely curtailed the Republicans' plans for Reconstruction. Federal support in the South dried up, and the economy was dead. Okay. Um, these types of things, Reconstruction takes money, but now there isn't any. Money dried up and the Republicans were in disarray. The Depression shook everyone. Much like what happened to us in 2008, for those of you that remember, it's 10 years ago. We had a, we had a depression that, was, that rivaled the one in 1930, 1929, I should say. <clears throat> 10 years ago, it was, it was tough, uh, a tough couple of years. And what, what happens to people when that happens? You lose your job, you lose your home. You, know, you you your savings account gets cut in half. Uh, what, what, you know all those types of things happen. So so what happens? So people don't care about social programs anymore. In in these days, the the Reconstruction era, they're they're not worried about the the poor, the plight of the poor sharecropper or the poor ex-slave. They're worried about themselves. Suddenly, right? I got to pay mortgage to feed my kids. So you kind of turn your back because you're focused on survival. Okay. Uh, and that's kind of what happened. The, the, the Northerners were tired of Reconstruction, too. They wanted to move on from the Civil War era. I, I think I may have mentioned the, the United States was behind the world at the start of the Civil War. The rest of the world, Europe specifically, was it, it was deeply involved in the, in the Industrial Revolution, industrializing, mechanizing, and this is a revolution that changed the world, created the modern world we have today. But the, the lead up to the Civil War in the first half of the 19th century, the war itself, America was busy dealing with that. So they were behind. So many people by, by the 1870s are saying, you know what, I, I don't care about the Civil War anymore. That's over. We did what we could for the, for the South, but let's move on and get involved in, in the Industrial Revolution and start businesses and make some money, okay? Uh, so what did this allow to happen in the South? Well, this, they, they, they stopped, uh, you know, enforcing down there. And this gave the Southerner a, ch a, ch a chance to gain, to, to regain further control. Okay. 
So I already mentioned the black codes, these, these, these laws designed to, you know, hold black men and women back, hold them back, return them to the fields. And then they came up with what were called poll taxes. What, so what's that? It, it's a tax you have to pay to vote. And you can look anywhere you want in the Constitution about voting. It doesn't say anywhere that it, that it costs you money. It doesn't cost money to vote. So in the South, in the Reconstruction era, the, the white uh, people would charge black people to vote, but not white people. Unconstitutional against the law, but they did it. So why would they do that? Because black people were ex-slaves. They didn't have any money. They were penniless. They couldn't pay a poll tax, so they couldn't vote. Another another uh, item that they used against the African voting was literacy tests, okay? These were tests that were, that were given only to black people. Now, remember, these people had never had any education, okay? Now they got to pass a test, and it wasn't a short test, okay? This this one this one goes up to 23 questions, and I, I don't know how long it, this actually was. It might have been more. You have to pass this test first. So, first of all, most of them couldn't read. So right off the bat, you're, you're finished. But if you could read, then you got to answer questions like number 17. Um, I'm sorry, number, number 15. In the space below, write the word noise backward and place a dot over what would be its second letter should it have been written forward. And it's, it's ridiculous. Not, not that you couldn't figure that out, but these, these people hadn't been around any type of logic training. You know, this is really what this is, is logic. So many of them didn't pass because they, it, was, it was too complicated and difficult for them. Again, nowhere in the Constitution does it say you have to be smart or educated or a college degree to vote. No, anybody can vote. A citizen at the proper age can vote. You can be, you know, um, a a person that has not accomplished anything. You can be a person of ill repute. You don't have to be a good a good person or educator or smart person if you're if you're a citizen and you're not in jail. You can vote. Okay. Another another uh, thing that they did was called the grandfather clause. So what's that? It said if your grandfather was a free man, then you could vote. Well, of course, a, a black man's grandfather, a, a black man or a woman who, of course, I'm, I'm not saying women because women were not given the vote, okay? Only men could vote in those days. We already talked about that. But um, in this case, uh, you, you give a, a, a black man the vote, um, but you're not enforcing it, okay? Um, so this is the problem. You know, you these people just don't you, you can't ever, ever get ahead, okay? Okay, so, um, you know, and, and again, obviously, a white person's grandfather would would be um, free, so he'd be able to vote, okay? All, all against the Constitution, all designed to hold the black man back, okay? But, you know, in a further, uh, more uh, violent sense, the KKK was there to intimidate and keep people from voting. You also had the Redeemers, uh, they were also a group that used, you know, violence and intimidation tactics. Uh, they're about redemption, redeeming the Old South, getting the Old South back. And by this time, the, the North was pulling out and they had their issues with the Panic of 1873, so nobody stopped them. So the South retook control and they returned the South to one that was based on white supremacy, okay? During this era, the Republicans lost much from the Depression, including political support. They lost half of the representatives in the House of Representatives, and the Democrats regained control of the House. The Supreme Court started to diminish civil rights legislation. So civil rights legislation that had been passed, they start to diminish that. Uh, these are called slaughterhouse cases. This is one of your terms in your book. One of these is called the United States versus Crookshank. What is that? This is a case that involved the murder of blacks in Louisiana. But, but the issue that came out of it was the Supreme Court ruled that each state could decide who has voting rights. Really? How, how could they do that? I mean, the 15th Amendment gave every uh, male that's a citizen the right to vote. Black, it didn't matter what color you are. As long as you were born on the soil and you were of age, you could vote. Federal legislation supersedes state, right? But here the Supreme Court says, nope, the states 
the states can decide what to do about voting. So again, completely unconstitutional, illegal, almost frighteningly so, but yet they, they got away with it. It, it happened, okay? Uh, so this, all, all of these incidents result in the disintegration of this idea of reconstruction, okay? And I mentioned earlier that the election of 1876 is the election that kind of finally brings it down. This is painted with controversy. Um, Rutherford B. Hayes is the uh, Republican candidate, okay? And he is giving the electoral votes from three states that were not back in the Union yet, okay? These three former Confederate states had not re-entered, so the people in that state weren't voting, so those electoral votes shouldn't have counted. But Hayes uh, was 19 votes short of winning, so the Republican uh, the Republicans gave Hayes the 20 vo uh, electoral votes from these three states illegally. Uh, and he won by, by one vote. Okay, he became the president. Now, uh, he agreed with, with the Republicans, if you do that for me, if you, you know, give me these votes and make me president, I will recall all the troops from the South. So all the military, uh, districts would be, would be ended. Okay. Uh, so what I want you to do now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I want you to uh, pause this in, in a minute. Let, let me tell you what to do here. Uh, watch our second film for Chapter 15. This is called The Compromise of 1877 Explained. Uh, the link is on the um, learning module page. Uh, and like I said, I'm sorry that I can't just start a film right here. For some reason, the audio doesn't work. So we'll do it this way and let, until I can get it figured out. Okay, so please uh, take a moment, pause this, go watch that film, and come back. Uh, this is less than six minutes long, okay? Okay. So moving forward, um, so Reconstruction is over. It was a complete failure. Um, major reason for the failure of it was the state's inability to suppress the violence of Southern whites when they sought reversal for blacks' gains. And that's a pretty profound statement. A major reason for the failure of Reconstruction was the state's inability to suppress the violence of Southern whites when they sought reversal for blacks' gains. That's it in a nutshell. The failure of Reconstruction was caused by violence that crushed black aspirations and the abandonment by Northern whites of Southern Republicans. So who was a Southern Republican? I mean, they're black people, right? There was not a white Republican in the entire South. That was the, that was the party of Lincoln. They hated him. He started civil war and freed the slaves. So a Southern Republican is a nice way of saying freed slaves, okay? So violence crushed their aspirations, and the North abandoned them, left them, left them swinging in the wind. Okay, <clears throat> so the so, so the 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 South was left back in the hands of the former slave owners, and for more than 90 years, fell back into a society based on racism, discrimination, and oppression, uh, breaking many laws. I've mentioned it a number of times. Four ignored the three Reconstruction Amendments because, again, nobody enforced them. And it would not be until 1965, okay? Violence in Selma. Selma is something we'll talk about later on in this class, the, the 60s civil rights movement, uh, led President Johnson to, uh, to step in and, and propose this voting act. So he proposes a new voting rights law. In early August, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law. So I'm jumping way ahead here to explain to you that it wasn't for a hundred more years they finally got their rights that was that were afforded them by the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Three Amendments, the, the Three Reconstruction Amendments. Okay, uh, all these years later, they finally get get their get their rights afforded to them. Now the bottom. Uh, Paragraph is the most important. This this act authorized the attorney general to send federal examiners to register qualified voters by by bypassing local officials. So all the poll tax and grandfather and literacy tests they bypass all that. We're going to register them with, the way that they're supposed to be and get around these people that are, that are trying to keep blacks from voting. Okay, <clears throat> uh, so. Yeah, this this act is a you know cr crowning achievement of the of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Uh, what what was the civil rights movement really about? It really was about trying to give the rights to black people 
that the Civil War era gave them 80, 90 years earlier that they just they just hadn't had the opportunity to, to, to actually have them yet because they were being held back from them. So, so again, people say, why study history? Well, I mean, here's a great reason why, because this explains the racial tension we have today. This is, this is why we still have it. This is only 53 years ago. That, you know, I'm, 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 I'm older than that, but this happened in my lifetime. Not that far back. I'm still here. It wasn't until 1965 that, that, that true equality starts. Does that mean that it happened in day one? No. 53 years later, we're still fighting about it. But, but, you know, the, the, the freedom for African Americans didn't start in 1865. It started in 1965. That that might be the most important thing that, for you to take from this entire class. This is a part of history that people don't know. They don't know about the injustices of the reconstruction of, of the Reconstruction era. They don't know that all those abuses created the modern civil rights movement, um, and and they don't know about Lincoln. Lincoln was gone, and with him went his kind, forgiving, and benevolent approach okay so after all the arguments between politicians ultimately what happens to reconstruction is the truth is excuse me the truth is uh the north just gave up they pulled out <clears throat> and leaving the freed slaves at the mercy of the southern white supremacists okay so i mentioned before how i like to bring the past to the present and, and show you how the past still has an influence on the present. So I'm going to talk to you about an organization that's uh, that's of modern times, controversial group. This is this is the Black Lives Matter group, okay? So we're going to understand now, understand me first. I'm not I'm not promoting this group. I'm not, you know, opposed to it. I'm just telling the story, okay? This group chose this name why? Because well, in, in, in modern times, in the last few years, there's been a there's been an upswing of young black men, boys being shot by white police officers. M more more incidents than 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 usual. There seems to be a trend. Okay, this is this of course has started a movement among black people, which of course it it, it would right if 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 you were of that group and and people of of your type are being killed because they're black. Of course, that's the accusation anyway. That would make you angry, right? So when they say Black Lives Matter, if you just go back in your lifetime to whenever you were born and look at look at that history, you would say, well, what do they mean by that? What about white people? What about Asian people? What about Hispanic people? Don't shouldn't you say all lives matter? Well, that's really not what they're saying. If you go back in in the American history, and of course you didn't, you don't have the Maybe you took 109, but if you hadn't, you know, the first half of American history is all about the abuse of black people. They were they were deemed not human. They were they were deemed as property. They were deemed as as replaceable. So they were they were abused and murdered and raped and sold and, and hung and burnt. You know, for for the first half of, of the of the of America's history until the Civil War frees them, I'm putting quotation around the word freeze because that didn't happen either. We just learned that right. Reconstruction didn't do that. A hundred more years, they still didn't matter. In my lifetime, I remember as a very young boy. Actually, I wasn't that young. You know, I was probably early teenager. Still hearing about lynchings in the South. It was just kind of part of the routine. You know, lynching lynching a black man was was something that you would do. And I'll show you later on in this class images of lynchings where you have the whole community of white people gathered around the person that was hung to take a picture and they're all smiling. They're, they're all happy to be part of the picture. You, you just murdered somebody. Okay, so now you come so you have that going on. Uh, all through um, you know the 20th century, 1965 to the present, yeah, it's gotten a lot better because of that Voting Rights Act. Also, the Civil Rights Act of of, of 1964 and the uh, Brown versus the Board of Education 1954. We'll talk about all those. You don't have to know that right now. So it's gotten better, but but the point they're trying to make here is that throughout most of history, black lives haven't mattered at all. They they, they haven't mattered at all. You could kill one, rape rape one, uh, you know, uh, uh, impregnate one, um, you know, hang one, and and you can do it in front of the police, and nobody would arrest you for it. Nobody would ever convict you of a crime against a black person. 
So you go through all these hundreds of years, and now today, now you have white police officers shooting them. All they're saying is, guys, we matter. Black lives matter. Okay, those days are over. Those days are gone. You can't continually abuse us. So our lives matter today. That's where it came from. So again, if you if you if you look back further than just your lifetime and go back to Reconstruction and go back to the pre-Civil War South and what it was like for black people, you better understand what these people are trying to say, okay? Okay, so to, to wrap this up and end this chapter, um, the the obvious question, maybe maybe not obvious, but a, a, a question that, that is kind of haunting in the background. You know, we had this huge war. And all these men died, and, and the South is destroyed, and all, I've gone over that enough times. But but a question lingers: twenty five years after the war, <clears throat> who really won the Civil War? I mean, the North won it on the battlefield, but twenty five years after the war, seventy five percent of freed people are are re enslaved by by sharecropping, right? Uh, the South has taken control this, uh, of that er area again. Uh, they, black people can't vote. If they can't vote, they can't become officials. If they can't become officials, they can't create change to their community. They're, they're oppressed, subjugated, right? Discriminated against. So all these years later, it's, it's hard not to ask the question, who really won the Civil War, okay? Okay, that is the end of chapter 15. Uh, so we will be, um, you have chapter 16 is next, and we're doing that this week. So go ahead and, and you know, move on to those, those, those videos, okay? Any questions, comments, discussion board first, and then, or email me, okay? Thank you.